I brought you out here to the mountains so you could see part of the uh, foundational work we're doing here at the ranch. Behind me, you can see the foundation. Uh, early this morning, the concrete trucks were coming in and out, and the slab has been poured. They're finishing the final work on the uh, foundation right now for our ministry center. This is a, a place where we're going to be able to bring 70 leadership people at a time, pastors and leaders and elders, and teach foundational truths and doctrine. Actually, we'll be able to sleep them and feed them and teach them uh, all right in this one little house right here. Over to the left behind this is where we're going to be putting the uh, lake. And so when you walk out on the front balcony of the ministry center, you're going to be able to look right out over the water and then back behind uh, to Hinch Mountain, which is actually 400 feet higher than Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga. So the uh, reason I brought you here is basically because I want to talk about foundations. A few months ago, I was blessed to be with Bishop Thomas Jakes at the Potter's House in Dallas, Texas, in the Pastor's Leadership Conference that he has annually there. Uh, the series that you have in your hand that you're going to be looking at is basically an overview of so many of the concepts, the ministry concepts, having to do with the things God is saying concerning His kingdom right now. And I touched just the high points. Actually, Bishop Jake said I just touched the tips of the icebergs as we went along. He said that probably 50 messages or sermons could be preached out of all of this one series. But actually, I did this overview so that you can see that there are so many powerful words right now that God is saying concerning His kingdom and our advance in the preceding Word of God. As you look at this, I'd like for you to uh, consider some of those things that are of great interest to you. If you find points that you think are extremely important in this overview in these three tapes in this series, uh, you might want to check our office because uh, we go into great detail on some of these issues, and you're going to find some of them in a series that we're doing at the ranch right now that we call Chapel Time at the Ranch. And we talk about each of these specific things. We talk about eschatologies. We talk about the rest of God. We talk about set ministry, multiplicity of ministry. We talk about that strange word perfection or maturity of the church. I think you're probably going to be blessed to see this. I'm, I'm really thrilled that you've joined us today. So sit back and watch the overview. It's actually being called apostolic doctrine or apostolic concepts. That's not a religious term. It's, it means like the apostles. We're going right back to the Word of God. Be blessed. See, we don't, uh, contrary to some uh, ideas, I do not teach nor will I be trying to talk today for your response, but I will measure it because I know that with whatever window you are able to give forth, the same measure and size you are able to take in. You can't get more in a door than you can get out a door. So if there's little response and little to every promise and blessing and thing that God gives, then there's probably very small chance you're going to get very much. So I measure what I say, you know, Bishop and I were talking the other night up until two o'clock in the morning we were talking and, and we were discussing the dilemma of ministry, especially to ministry, because there are so many already preconceived ideas. We already have our own little pigeonholed doctrines. We already know everything we think we ought to know about everything we ever want to know anything about. That all we want to do is get up and get blessed in what we've got rather than to be moved into a place in God that maybe we have never been. And that's a real tragedy for ministry. It really is. And so my, my job today is just to be me. And that's a tragedy for you. <laughs> But I'm looking for open doors and open hearts and spirits that are hungry. If you're hungry, say yes. yes. Ah, now I'll teach.
My subject has been already prescribed and you have looked in whatever manuals you received and portfolios I am to teach on apostolic doctrine or apostolic order. When we say apostolic, we are not trying to be denominational as in one thought of doctrine, but rather like the apostles in the order that is prescribed in the New Testament church. So we could perhaps as aptly say we are searching for New Testament order, New Testament church order. I'm going to take a daring chance today um, and do what I believe God is laying in my spirit to do. So I'll come in a side door today and uh, we'll probably get shocked, all of us, in this first session because I'm probably not going to start with some of the things that you might expect when I talk about apostolic order. I have to, and I'm already teaching, just because I haven't read a scripture, I'm already talking. Don't wait for me to open my Bible for you to get something. Okay. I have to be aware of the times. I must be concerned with not just who we are, but where we are. We are the people upon whom the ends of the world are come. We are supposed to be those people who bring into completion and perfection those things that could never be made perfect in all the other ages. There should have been in us already the glorious consummation of eternal purposes so that what we are, who we are, by the generational blessing and the flow down of more than two millenniums from a bloody cross should make us more able, more understanding, more revelatory, more equipped than any other people on the face of the earth at any other time in history. We should not be coming here to try to figure out what to do. We should already have known by now what to do. We should not be coming here to see if we can get a new idea so we can go home and spawn it on our people. But that is usually what these kind of meetings are thought to be. And just to put myself into alignment and into submission with the desire of Bishop Jakes, we discussed some of these things the other evening until very late in the night. And it is his heart as it is mine, and I'm sure if you heard him last night you know this. It is his heart that we could have come this far and seem to understand so little. And then when we listen to the great mass of preaching and teaching and the words that are printed and written, there are more things said today about Christianity. There are more books. There are more pamphlets. There are more workbooks. There are more presentations by television, by video, by radio than ever in the history of the world. There's more being talked about Christianity than at any other time in the history of the world. You agree with that? And yet we are doing less per capita in the world than they did in the babyhood of the church when the blood was still warm from a cross and their understanding only compiled in three and a half years of training. So my approach, this is not going to be rebuking, it's just going to be reality that we have to face. We need to face some reality. I want to tell you something else. I'm going to magnify my office today. 
I'm going to be, I am not embarrassed to do this. A long time ago, pain and process separated me from my gift. I know that what I have in God is not me. The tragedy in so much ministry is that we think we are our gift. We start assuming we are who our gift is. And we don't realize that we're just us and the gift is God. Consequently, we live a pseudo life in ministry of trying to elevate ourselves into our gifts so people receive us as our gift rather than knowing us heart to heart as people. And then appreciating the gift as being something that's God that I can respect in myself as you do. And I can respect it in you. But I'll magnify my gift and office today in apostleship to you and tell you that the word I'm about to speak to you is a word of judgment. Now when I say judgment instantly, a greater percentage of all of us sitting in here think that fire, I'm thinking fire is going to fall out of heaven. I'm not talking about judgment as to destroy. If a judge sits and he is in chambers, a judge judges or judgment is made as a decision. When I say judgment, I'm talking about a decision. And that means that judgment is made. It's either this way or it's this way. Now, the reason I say this is because of what Jesus said. I want you to remember this. Catch this with me just a minute. Just because I haven't read a scripture doesn't mean I'm not teaching. Jesus was in a house. And his disciples came to him and said, there are some Greeks here who want to see you. Remember the Greeks who came to Jesus? And they said, sirs, we would see Jesus. Philip and Andrew finally got over to the office, knocked on the door and said, Jesus, there are a couple of gentlemen out here. And they've come a long way to the feast. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, you understand me. Uh, and uh, and before they leave and get on the boat and go back home, they just thought they'd like to just at least shake your hand. Maybe you could sign their book for them. They just like to look at you. Jesus flies off the wall. He didn't say, well, I don't really have a lot of time or I'm kind of busy. Right? He didn't. He said, now is the judgment of this world. He started out. Now is the time when the son of man should be glorified. The next thing he said is, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. I mean, he, he goes into a, a tirade. You got to act. What's that got to do with a couple of Greeks? And then he goes on and says, now is the time that the Son of Man should be glorified. And he starts praying then. I mean, you know, and here's then Philip and Andrew going, oh, Lord. We just wanted you to just say hi to a couple of Greeks out here. And you're going into this fall into the ground and die thing. You're going into this, the Son of Man going to be crucified. You're going into all this. Now you're praying. He's saying, Father, glorify thy name. And a voice fell from heaven. And it said, I have glorified it. Say one Say one. one. She said, I have glorified and I will glorify it again. Say two. two. These are the two immutable things in the which God cannot lie. This is the power of confirmation. This is the double enunciation of deity. This is why when God takes over a sovereign place so that you do not do the thing of God, but God does it not only in the heavenlies, but in the earth. He always says, Samuel, Samuel, Saul, Saul. That means you didn't get up, your choir didn't sing, and you didn't preach the sermon that got the apostle saved. God sovereignly moves into a situation and does what he's going to do in the earth as he has already prescribed it in the heavenlies. These are the flashes of the sovereignty of God that we do not even understand because we have not come into a perfection and a completion so that God can work both in the heavenlies and in the earth the thing that he's already prescribed. That's the whole kingdom principle. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. 
as it when he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself in the heavenly, saying, I'm going to bless Abraham. Then he swore with an oath on the earth. I'm going to bless in thee and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And the Bible said these are the two immutable things in the which God cannot lie. <clears throat> now, we are going to have to get there. To see done in our ministries the thing we want to see done because we are still trying to work for God. We come with mindsets about what can I do for God? And the issue is there is a place in God where he would work for us. But we're going to have to quit all our stuff. Now I'm going to try my best to offend as many of you as I can. No, no, no. I'm serious. And I'm going to tell you why. Because every other preacher you'll hear in the next two years, three years or whatever, they're going to try to bless you. And I think it's a tragedy for God to add luxury to our laziness. I think we need to stop asking God to give harvest into the hands of those who have not been able to allow God to do his purposes already. We encompass land and sea to make one disciple and one proselyte. And often we make them twofold the child of hell. Because we want them to be just like us. They, we want our church to be filled up with more people who gossip, talk bad, are out, out of authority, won't submit to ministry. We want God to add to all the stuff we go through all the time. And we're not ready to go back to the foundations and say, there must be a place in God where all this stuff we call Christianity can cease. And if we're going to build and have a harvest, the first thing we need to do is stop begging God for a harvest and ask him to give us seed time. Woo, that didn't get much response, did it? The order is seed time and, but we want harvest and no seed time because if you don't qualify the seed, the harvest can never be better than the seed. But see, what I'm saying here is so controversial and so different than mo most folks expect to hear. We want to get some tools so we can go back home and continue to build the stuff we've already got going. And God said, I'd like to pull a lot of things down that you've already got going. And cast down a lot of stuff you borrowed from Tulsa and Portland and New Orleans. and Orlando and Toronto and wherever else we get our ideas from because a good part of what we call the vision in our houses are not the vision of God at all we borrowed an ear from one place an eye from somewhere else a nose from someplace else a mouth from somewhere else and in our modern age we put it on cut and paste stuck this thing together came into a committee meeting talked about what we thought we could do that worked over there and it looked good down there and it's working in Dallas so why wouldn't it work somewhere up in Utah hey and we put this all together and say this is the vision for our house that's not a vision that's a graven image God didn't tell you to do that We borrow ideas from people we don't even know. And what God told them someplace else is absolutely not necessarily what he's wanting you to do in your setting. But see, if we change that, that means we'd have to get on our face. That means God would tear up some of our toys. Mess up some of our good stuff that we got going on. Because all we really want is a better music director, a sharper administrator, so we can do more of our stuff.
We have such a mingled seed of truth and religion. How y'all doing? Hey, I can go back to the room. It don't bother me. I'm going to go back to the ranch anyhow. I didn't want to come out in the first place. No. I'm here on mandate. You're never going to be able to think the same when I get through today. We have a sickness spawned on us. Since we are borrowers of anything we think might work. We have a sickness spawned on us by an anemic modern Christianity. That doesn't want you to pay a price for anything. The only price they want you to pay is at the book stand. And the heart and soul of that charismatic idea is that if you're going through something, it's either the devil fighting you or you're lacking in faith. Come on. Talk back to me. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. Is that right or wrong? Your brother, if you're going through something, well, there must be something wrong in your life then, see? Got to be something wrong with, see, brother? See, see, and all that stuff you went through a few years ago, you know, that was really a bad situation, but you got it all repented of, got it under the blood, got it taken care of. But see, then the devil, I, I mean, this, and, and we're talking about, we're not talking about young saints having to fight a battle. We're talking about preachers, ministry people, who for years assign blame for their inadequacy on something that happened in their past because we never brought closure. We, we don't really even believe in the power of the blood. We preach it, sing it, but we don't really believe it. Hey, if it weren't for the blood, would none of us be here? And I've got more news for you. There's more qualification in people who've been through hell than the folks who don't have a pimple on them. So it's either you, you know, you're, you're reaping your past or you don't have faith, brother. If you just had faith, you need to get in the word and have a little faith. Praise God. Because if you had faith, you wouldn't be going through this thing right now. Or else, well, brother, we got a big devil in our town, you know. <laughs> Praise God. Praise his holy name. <laughs> These are all excuses for absolute laziness. Excuse me. Don't talk to me about the devil beating you up because he really is nothing but just a rat with a loud mouth. If you remember, he lost his keys and he has no authority unless you give it to him. Now, why am I telling preachers that? The next thing that is, in my opinion, a doctrine of devils, and I'm going to be bold here. See, see, I, I don't care. See, that's what gives me great licenses. I just don't care. I'm not looking to be any place. I'm not hoping I'm going to get a platform. I don't, I'm not hoping they're going to let me be on TBN because I really don't want to be there anyhow. And every time I'm on there, I think, boy, if I say what I got to say, at least they'll leave me alone. I won't have to be back here anymore. That's exactly what my mindset is. Somebody has got to say what needs to get said to a generation. And nobody needs it more than men and women of God who have been beat up and beat around. Let me tell you, the church, the kingdom of God will prevail. There is no such idea that we will not succeed. 
The tragedy is you just may not be a part of its success. This idea that if you're going through something, you don't have any faith. It has taken away the whole truth of process. And that's how God brings us into his purpose. Now you may think I'm far afield, but I'm going to minister out of my spirit today. I, I want to get after a while. If I've got time, I'll get to something, but I'm on something right now. Because until we change our minds, there's no use for me to teach anything. Why should I start teaching something to say, here's how you build? Before you build, there's some stuff we got pulled down. I'm in a pulling down mode today. Come on, talk back to me. Truth is what God says. But religion is what man says God says. And we've said for so long that what we're doing is God. All our borrowed stuff. We listen endlessly to other people that we're not related to. That's because we have not many fathers. We're disconnected from generational blessing. So in every generation, we jump around and try to find the best thing we can find and then see if we can succeed in our generation, leaving nothing for the next generation. And then they start all over again. So instead of it being multiplied and doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled and double portioned, we live in single portions in each generation. It dies with our most magnificent preachers and teachers. And the next generation comes up and we start looking for more superstars in that generation who have been totally disconnected from anything else. And they start borrowing. And we borrow and borrow and borrow. As Jeremiah said, they borrow everyone his neighbor's words. We preach each other's sermons. There's nothing wrong with you saying what a father in ministry says who has sired you into the ministry. If my son comes to my ranch while I'm gone, he, can, he knows where the keys to my truck are. He knows where my tools are. He can go saddle my horses and go ride. He can go up on the high meadows. He can go up there and stay in one of the little mountain houses. Because he's my son. He's in relationship with me. He doesn't even have to ask me. And if you talk to him long, he'll say, you know what my dad always said? He's got a right to talk about it because he's my son. But now if I come home and my truck's been moved. And my horses have been saddled. And somebody's been staying in my mountain houses up on top of the ministry park. And I get back up there. I'm going to find out who the heck has been messing with my stuff. <laughs> but we drink stolen waters out of borrowed canteens. And then hide the source. So nobody will know. We stole it. And we put this all together. And this is supposed to be our vision of the work. Of, how am I doing? You can tell I'm very nervous right now. <laughs> if I was a real powerful preacher, I'd say reach over and touch three people. But... Right now, you better not reach over and do nothing. <laughs> Just sit there and bite down, that's all. <laughs> Come on, somebody bless the Lord today. No, 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 no. Bless the Lord. Man, 
this is a big desk. That room in here, you could lay in there and take a nap. I got a big towel, too. I steal these. See, it's got bishop on it. I'm not a bishop. I think I, I, think I got this one in Miami. And I go around and see if they leave them laying around. There. See, process is God's way of taking you into his full purpose. God always tells you purpose first. He's sneaky in the way he talks. He gives you the first line and the last line all in one sentence. Get thee up and get thee out. Conjunction and I will show you a land. In talk about in that one sentence, you need to take that little comma and that and and just get a hold of it and scoot it. We scoot it twenty five years apart. He didn't tell you nothing about your brother dying in Heron. Didn't tell you nothing about your daddy passing away in the same town. Didn't tell you nothing about your nephew turning on you, making a fool out of you. Taking a, he didn't tell you nothing about the fact that Sarah is wrinkled up and dead and you still hadn't got a boy. He didn't tell you nothing about that. But he didn't fail you because he didn't talk about it. He thought that you would just keep on walking. He thought that you wouldn't stop and go back. If they had minded the place from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to go back. But they weren't thinking about where they came from. He was thinking about where he was going. And whatever it takes to get there, I'm going to go through. But see, no, sit down. But the going through it is what we blame on the devil. It wasn't the devil. Well, maybe I shouldn't have left her. He wasn't talking about what happened in his past. Even when he, even when he gave Sarah, his wife, to Pharaoh. You want to talk about that? Talk about a big mess. Take your own wife and pawn her off to some big... So, 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 because you're afraid of the authority of Pharaoh and him. Even he, he we didn't go. He, he, you know, I mean, you have to make a decision then. That you got to start thinking about the Pharaoh going to be sleeping with your wife. He made a decision, made a bad decision too when he got Hagar. That's a bad decision. See, so I mean, you know, if it's it's a matter of personal failure, then, my God, how come we walking in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham? See, our, our, our problem is that this new modern doctrine has taught us to have faith for things. We're having faith that God will give us the city. We're having faith that God will give us people. We're having faith that God will, uh, will just give us a new building. We've got faith that God is going to send us some real strong ministry folks to support this vision. And we've got faith that God's going to really help us to get that new home, too. <laughs> you know, something important. You know, the man of God and the woman of God need a nice place to live. And uh, faith that God is going to give us some. And the Bible didn't say to have faith for things. He said have faith in God. But see, you don't need faith in God unless you're going to go through something. It says, through faith, they obtained the promises. By faith, they wandered. Did you ever think it takes more faith to wander around, not know where you're going, than it does to have faith to know exactly what God's supposed to do for you? 
Sometimes you need faith to wander. Sometimes you need faith in your wilderness. You need to stop cursing your wilderness and blaming it on the devil and on a lack of faith and on your past. You need to say, God's got me in process. This is not the devil. This is God. He's knocking the snot out of me. He's shaking me like a rag doll because he doesn't want this religion on me anymore. He wants to separate truth and religion out of me so he can take me back to pure foundations and let me start building on what God said not what men said take a deep breath You know what really worries me? That we're only a handful of months away from a new millennium. And we're having to talk like this. I think some of you probably think I'm teaching if I read the Bible. Let me go back here and see if I can find a verse someplace. Oh, here's a good one. <laughs> yeah, how about Hebrews chapter 5? Hmm. See, I wish I could just take this whole book of Hebrews because it is the connecting book of the New Testament to all of the truths of the Old Testament that tie together the schoolmaster. And the provided promise. Now, I'm going to read this verse and then I'm going right back where I was. <laughs> if you think we're off the hook, no, we're just going to read this verse from the hook. Okay. <laughs> See, I wish I... I wish I had time to, to work on the first part of this fifth chapter. Every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He's got to have compassion on the ignorant and them that are out of the way there. They don't understand and some of them are totally out of order. And the only way he can have compassion is that he himself, this high priest, also is compassed with infirmity. He's been totally and absolutely surrounded by infirm, unstable circumstances and survived. See, sometimes qualification is not that you've never been through nothing. It's that you came through it and survived. Now, I've read enough here now. That I can go and teach a little bit, can I? But see, if you're not going to go through anything, say go through. But see, if we don't go through anything, then, then how can we come out if we've never been thrust in? How can we be delivered if we've never been through anything? The idea of cheap religion excluding us from any possible process. We curse our wildernesses. We feel like we're really being done in by somebody or something. And most of the time, it's just that we have so much accumulation of stuff. And some of it is enormous idolatry. Because anything you take that you created and say it's God... And offer it to other people for holy worship and command obedience to it and make rules by it. And you know where it came from? The tree of the knowledge of good and of evil came out of our head and from borrowed ideas and we make it law and we make people live by it. And God never said it. In the first place. I'm going to make a statement here. 
we're going to see a glorious remnant church. Man, tomorrow, I can't wait to get, if I can get there, I want to talk about the corporate man. I want to talk about the man child. That'll scare some of you to death. I want to talk about the thing that God is raising up in the earth. And I want to tell you why we're all going through so much stuff. I want to talk to you about why the government is shaking. Why the head of government is being, is, is being targeted. I want to talk about why we are hearing more and more at the same time now peace talks about the Middle East. Why the financial structure, the stock market is wavering. Why Asia is being crushed in its finance. I want to talk about why the storms and why... All creation is groaning and travailing. You know why? Waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. God's waiting for somebody to be manifest in the earth that's not religious. Somebody that's a pure son. You know what else I got to get on before I get out of here? I got to get on something else. And that is... Oh man. I got to be careful here. Uh, we, we're going to have to talk about this idea of uh, being born again. We're trying to get the world born again. And the Apostle Paul said, my little children, say little children. It means babies, infants. My little children in whom I travail again in birth until Christ be formed in you. He wasn't talking to sinners. He was talking to little children. And he's saying, I got to travail until you get born. We call the new birth, the born again experience. Oh, this is going to be fun. I might as well just talk about this right now. <laughs> I'll come back and read a little more so we'll catch up here after a while. When Jesus said you must be born again, who was he talking to? Who was Nicodemus? A ruler of what? The religious leader of the day. There was no other form of gospel or doctrine. But what God had delivered through Moses to the Jewish people. Jesus came to his. It was his own that received him not. When Jesus said ye must be born again. He wasn't talking to the sinners. He was talking to the churchmen. Who was Paul talking to when he said, my little children, in whom I travail again in birth, birth, till Christ be formed, till you get the real image of Christ, not the image of men, not the image of ideas, not the image of denominations, not the image of systems, not the image of fellowships, the image of Christ is in you, till whatever comes birthed out of the church is a pure Jesus. Boy, it's quiet now. See, we ought to all go into holy travail until what comes out of us is not what we have become by what we've attached ourselves to or what has been attached to us. We need to go into holy travail, not to find out what God told somebody else, but what God told me. Uh, just a minute. You all left me here. No, you left me here. I hit a snag here you don't want to talk about. So I'm going to talk about it. Shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have clammed up on me like that. I'd have got on to something you enjoy. I'm saying the church needs to be born again. I say to you, religious leaders, lawyers, teachers. He was a teacher of the Jews. 
He comes and tries to equate himself to Christ. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. How can these things be done except God is with you? But Jesus interrupted him. Didn't even comment on what the man had said. Didn't comment on whether he was a teacher or not. But see, when he's saying, we know that you're coming from God because we see these things God is doing. Jesus instantly told him why he couldn't see them. And why they would never happen through him. Because he was in another dimension that he could not see them in unless he was reborn into. And that's why he said, the the wind bloweth where it listeth, where it wants to. So is every one that is born of the are y'all still here? The wind, in the same passage, he says to Nicodemus, the wind bloweth where it listeth. We say, okay, so the wind is like the spirit. Though the, here comes the wind of the spirit. Did, did you ever read that verse? Did you ever really read it? You know what it said? The wind blows where it wants to. I mean, it comes with force. It comes with modulation. It comes with speed. It comes with slacking. There are motions in the, say there are motions in the spirit. There are ebbs and tides. There are comings and goings. God is a moving thing. The first time you ever see him in his Bible. The earth is without form and void. Darkness is upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of the Lord move. Come on, say he move. You get way back down at the end of the book. It's even so. Come, Lord Jesus. And between the goings and the comings of the Lord. As many as are led by the spirit of God. They are the sons of. Not as many as have found a niche and a religious position and are stuck. In it. It's the moving of God in us that makes us the sons of God. We are only sons of God because we can move like the wind. It didn't say that the wind was the spirit like the spirit. It said so is everyone. It's you that can be moved. It's you that can be shaken. It's you that can be adjusted. You who? You religious leaders. We want the church to move, but we are unmoved. We want the church to be shaken, but we think we have arrived. Because we've been preaching for 25 years, 30 years, 50 years. We think that we've got a corner on God's opportunity. And the truth is God is passing by all of our collected wisdom. Because he does not want to manifest himself through idolatry. And he's not going to manifest himself through your borrowed opinion. God out of the dust and ashes of a shaken generation is going to raise up a remnant people who have given themselves to process and say, whatever it takes, I refuse to be left out of the purpose of God in my generation. Hey. But it's easier for you to sit around. And go into what you call intercession. And fight what you call spiritual warfare. <laughs> oh, we just, we've been in spiritual warfare. No, what you're really saying is you've been in process. And what you're really doing by saying that you've been in spiritual warfare is saying that you're fighting the devil. And it's the devil who has besieged you. Which immediately eliminates the truth. And that is that God is not happy with where you are. And he's willing to let you walk round and round for a long time. Until you seek him. And we have coined this spiritual warfare thing. And the truth is that you can't even build God's church in warfare. 
His church is not built by warfare. I'm going to get real bold. It's a ploy. It's a gimmick. To get you to blame the devil for all your trouble. And of course we pray in vain when we rebuke the devil for something God is trying to work out in our lives. So you're going to stay in spiritual warfare the rest of your life because you hadn't even talked to God about the issue yet. And that is he don't like where you are and he's not satisfied to leave you where you are. And the more you say, God, take us into that great place where your purpose can be done, then he just makes it tougher. And then you just keep fighting the devil. And it gets harder and you just keep fighting the devil. Oh, oh you, well, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Yeah. Rulers of darkness. Yeah. When he said we, he wasn't talking about the whole church. He was talking about his apostleship. He even comes down and says, we wrestle principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Say spiritual wickedness spiritual. in high places. The same term in the Greek, in high places, is we sit together in heavenly places. What the, Paul was saying is the big fight we have in our apostleship is that we don't just fight spirits in the world, but we come right down, we've got devils in the church in high places where we should be sitting in Christ Jesus. It's the religious people that are going to kill Jesus. The biggest battle we've got to fight is not trying to win the world, it's trying to change the mind of the clergy. Because if we came into apostolic order, you could stop your pseudo-evangelism. You could cancel about two-thirds of your programs that are costing you 90% of your budget. <clears throat> because if we came into absolute apostolic order, then we would come into the third dimension of grace, which is the sovereign place in God, where you simply come into order and God works through you. And you stop trying to build a church because we've got a jealous Jesus on our hands. And we're making him more jealous every day. And everything you do makes him more jealous. You know why? He's a jealous God. You know what he's jealous about right now? He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And we're trying to do it for him. No, you didn't get that. How much time have I got? How am I doing? Am I doing good? I'm scared to ask them. Thank you. Who said that? You come up here and sit with me. <laughs> Are you okay? Take a deep breath. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> what did I do with my glasses? I got to read some more Bible. Y'all don't think I'm teaching. See, y'all were all excited when I started, but you're not too excited now. I don't, I don't feel too much excitement in you right now. See, I really wish I could get down here in this fifth chapter. It says... Uh, and uh, by the reason, verse 3 hereof, or that since you've been completely surrounded by unstable, unstable circumstances, you've been through a lot of stuff. Say, say I've been through some stuff. Say, I'm going through some stuff. Look up here at me and say, all the stuff I'm going through is not the devil. Look up here at me and say, a lot of the stuff I'm going through could very well be God trying to change me and to bring me into order. And you don't want to be telling God, I rebuke thee, get thee behind me. I resist this thing. I won't receive this thing. So God goes away. 
because you sent him away. At the same time, you're saying you want him. But when he comes, Psalm 50 said, Our God shall come and shall not keep silence, but a fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall speak to the heavens above and to the earth beneath. Say one, one two. two three. There you go. The heavens above and the earth beneath, saying, Gather my people, to, not, not the sinners down the street, Gather my people together, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the fact is that if you want God to come, the first thing he does is send a fire. If you don't think so, go ask Elijah. He gets off in a cave somewhere. He's trying to find God. He's all by himself. And here comes fire. And the Bible said God wasn't in the fire. Of course not. He sends that before him. A fire devours before him. He's not going to come talk to you in the shape you're in. He's going to send fire first. Then here comes a strong wind. But God wasn't in the wind. Of course not. He sends the wind before he comes. So he can blow some of this stuff off of us. An earthquake. Going to be very tempestuous round about us. Say, but God wasn't in the earth. Of course not. He sends that before he comes to talk. You wonder why God hadn't been talking to you. You've been fighting the storm. Cursing your wilderness. Hating the fire. Rebuking the wind. And then God spoke in a still small voice. Said, Elijah, Elijah. You know why he can talk in a still small voice? Because all the stuff he'd been trying to talk through, he got burned off, blown off, and shaken off. Now he don't have to scream at you. Somebody bless the Lord in this house. Come on. Jesus knew who he was when he was 12. You remember that story? He's 12 years old. It's the first year he gets to go up to the temple because, you know, he's had his bar mitzvah. Thou art a man, my son. <clears throat> so he gets to go to the temple with Mary and Joseph. And he's in there getting real busy, confounding doctors and lawyers. They're scratching their head and, and thumbing through scrolls and yeah, that, that is what Isaiah said, isn't it? Hmm. Hmm. Whoa. What'd you say you're from, boy? Who's your daddy? They left him. <laughs> yeah, they're really keeping an eye on him, aren't they? I, I love it when they've gone a whole day's journey and they're looking for him. You know where they searched first? Among the kinfolks. That's where we get most of our theology. Well, that's what I was brought up in. Why should I seek God? That's what they always do. Who is they? And who is the they? that told them what was right. And how do you know that they knew what the purpose of God for you was? And what makes you think that their vision was your purpose? Hallelujah. 
hey, I can leave and go back to the ranch. I, honestly, honestly, I don't mean to upset you. I ought to be making you happy. Somebody in here right now ought to be screaming in your spirit, saying, thank God. I'm telling you, if we get on our faces just a little bit, God is going to be right there. He's just waiting just for one small motion out of us in his direction. He's doing a quick work in the earth. We're not talking about taking months and years to try to figure out what to do. We're talking about if we could just give it all up. Give it up. Give it up. Come back to base zero and say... I don't know anything but my hunger. I don't search for anything but your purpose. I don't know anything but what you tell me from this moment forward. I hunger after you, oh God. I do not hunger after success. I do not hunger after souls. I don't hunger after buildings. I don't hunger after churches. I don't hunger after my ministry. I don't hunger after harvest. I don't hunger after anything. I hunger after thee, oh God. I am hungry. For, I long for thee more than they that wait for the morning. I seek thee and thee alone, oh God. And whatever else happens in my life has got to be the product of that dying uh, this high priest business Verse 4, no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Say, as was Aaron. As was Aaron. Say, nobody calls himself to preach. Nobody calls himself. Say, nobody calls himself to be a high priest. Nobody calls himself to be a high priest. It, has to it has to happen as the order of Aaron. Order of Aaron. Now, what was the order of Aaron? No man may be a priest unless he is the son of a priest we are the sons of religion we are the sons of organizations we are the children of systems who is your father you seek to command men to whom have you submitted? Who did you serve? How long were you willing to be anything or nothing? You say, well, brother, the call of God is on my life. That's right, most of us went to preach when we were 12. Because Jesus knew exactly who he was when he was 12. When his mother came back and found him in the temple still teaching. She said, where have you been? The real question is, where had she been? Because we'll always find him right where we left him. You know where that is? Jerusalem. The birthing place. Not just an ancient town. Everything that ever comes into quality purpose is birthed out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem which above us is free which is the mother of us all. This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world beginning at Jerusalem. First Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost part. If you're going to enter into a Melchizedek priesthood. See, you can have the promise of purpose for 25 years. You're going to be the father of many nations. But until you get to Jerusalem, you have no boy. 
because he's going to meet Melchizedek, who is king of Salem, king of peace, Jeru, Salem, city of peace. And when he meets Melchizedek, Hebrew says without question, the lesser paid tithe to the greater. He found someone to submit to. He cannot be a father until he is first a son. He can have the promise of being a father because God tells you that in that one sentence deal. Way back in the beginning. And we assume that since he said it, we're ready. Because we think that the gifts are the callings. But the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. And one translation says the gifts chi with the callings are without repentance. It's possible for you to have gifts and for God to repent that he gave it to you. But it's impossible for you to have a gift and go through process. Many are called. Few are. And if you go through the process, if you're willing to walk on through the 25 years, then once you obtain the promise, it's impossible to take it back. He met Melchizedek. He paid him tithe of all. Oh, I wish I had time to get on that. And I probably will before this week's over. Of course, I don't know how many of y'all going to be here tomorrow. But <clears throat> Because what I'm doing right now is just going to go on and on and on. We're not going to get on another subject. We're just going to go through this. See, the revelation is vascular. Every vein leads to another vein, leads to another, eventually leads to the heart. The same blood that's in the heart flows into every part of Revelation. It's impossible to separate one from the other after a while. After a while, it just all amalgamates and becomes truth. And so he meets Melchizedek, pays him tithe of all. Tithe is the seal of response of sons to fathers. If we go back to Malachi this week, we'll have to show in the second chapter that the entire book of Malachi was not written to saints. It was written to preachers. This commandment, O oh, priests, is for you. We use it every Sunday to gather the tithe away from our congregations. And then we tithe back into our churches and pay ourselves. Or give it to some evangelist that comes through so you can kind of boost the offering. Amen. Never dawned on us that all our tithe must be tithed up. When the priest of the Lord shall lift up and heave offering up of a tenth part of the tithe of the people, he has to take it and heave it up. Then it shall be reckoned as the corner of the threshing floor and the fullness of the wine press. God, who calls the things that are not as though they were, will get on some of that probably tomorrow. The like as principle. When you receive the tithe of the people and heave it up, only then are the people blessed. Oh, no, see. We say, you tithe, God's going to bless you. That's not necessarily true. Because if you didn't take the tithe, and receive, men on earth have a commandment to receive tithe. If you didn't do what you were supposed to to it and with it, then they are not blessed. But if you do the right thing with the tithe that comes into your hand, by tithing of that tithe, then God counts that what they gave was not 10%. He counts that it was everything they had in their threshing floor and the fullness of their wine press. God literally writes down for your congregation that they gave everything they had. When you, the priests of the Lord, do what you're supposed to do. Where's all the excitement? Where's all this joy? Are you okay? Now you thought I forgot where I was. No, no, no. I'm right there where Abraham's tithing to Melchizedek. And when he does that night, say that night, that night, he falls into a vision. 
he falls into a dream. Once he tithes to Jerusalem, to Melchizedek, king of Salem, once he does that, that night he falls into a vision. And the vision is that there is an altar, and he is to lay on that altar five things. Are you all still here? Is, is this too deep for you? This worries me. Bishop and I were talking about this the other night. This worries me. You know what worries me? I'm talking nothing but Bible here. And I look into the blank faces of people who are supposed to be in ministry. It's one thing to be stunned, and I understand that. But it's something else to just be blank. Like, I don't know what he's talking about. And there's a bunch of you in here. See this board? It was just to make you worry. No, I was going to write on it, but I can't even get to it. You know why I can't get to it? Because we've got so much that needs to be worked on before we start building anything. Oh, Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, verse 5. Well, then how did he get to be a high priest? But he that said, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. See, I haven't forgotten Abraham. I haven't forgotten him. Jesus was 12 years old. He knew who his father was, and he knew what his purpose was. Wist thou not that I must be about my father's business. He knew what his father's business was. He knew he had come to do his father's business. And he knew who he was and who his father was. If that's true, let me hear a, an amen in this house. Amen. That's where we all go to preach. Bless God, I'm called. Know what God, I know what God's called me to do. Praise his holy name. That's where most of us go to preach. The next verse says, but. But, say but. but. So he knew who he was, knew who his father was, knew what his business was. But, say but. but. He went with them and was subject unto them. It's going to be 17 years before he ever teaches a doctrine, calls a disciple, or does a miracle. But we got our finger in our Bible and chafing to get out and do something and see if we can't go build a church. And that's what we've done. We've built a church, but we have not necessarily built the church because our jealous Jesus wants to do that all by himself. And what he really wanted us to do was to come into order and into alignment. So all we did was to be in him. We live. Maybe we ought to start counting here. We live and and have our say third dimension the house can only be built in the third dimension god's church cannot be built in the second dimension or in the first dimension you'll build your house in the first dimension you'll build your church in the second dimension but you can't build god's house unless you're in the third dimension in him we live and move and if any man be in Christ. <clears throat> so we have this Jesus who knew who he was, knew his calling. Am I going over this enough? If you've got that and you want me to move on, say yes. yes. If you've got that, say yes. yes. That's about a third of us probably. 
When Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek, without question, the lesser paid tithe to the greater. Instantly, he's in a vision. You know what he lays on that altar? A heifer, a ram, a she-goat, a pigeon, and a turtle dove. Remember that? And the Bible says he cut them apart in the midst and laid them one against the other. In other words, all of these sacrifices had to become one on that altar. What was that? Fivefold ministry. Instantly, God put him into his ministry. Only when he tithed to Melchizedek. Only when he came into the dominion. See, he had a promise of having a son for 25 years, but he has no son. What we do is we get a promise of a son and go out and try to create one. And it's the process and coming into the purpose of God. That's why you're going through what you're going through. God wants to bring you into your final pur- into your great purpose that he purposed in himself before the world was. Every one of you has such a dynamic, unbelievable, unspeakable purpose in God. But it will never come to pass with all the stuff we've got hanging on us. You know what I believe is going to happen in this great travailing, shaking? You know why we're going through all the stuff we're going through right now? Because God is going to take away from us everything he never told us to do. What if he took away from us everything he never told us to do. Could, could, I just, could I just say that nobody calls himself to preach and, and Jesus had no license to ministry even though he knew who he was and what his purpose was until a father said thou art my son. Until the father introduces you and announces you as having gone through process you really have no right to ministry your gift does not give you the right your calling does not give you the right only the voice of a father gives you the right to ministry if you don't have the book you have not many fathers how many of you have this book let me see your hands I do not believe this you got it right there. Everybody in this house, I don't, I don't even, th- I don't know how many, bro. This is forwarded by Bishop Jakes. If you don't read anything else, read the forward. That'll change your life. I asked him to forward it, and he sent me four typed pages, single spaced. I wrote back and I said, I did not ask you to write the book. <laughs> It's one of the most powerful, profound truths. And what I'm talking about here in fathers and sons right now, when Elijah saw Elisha go away, he said, my my father, my father, he didn't say, oh man of God, oh man of God, oh prophet, oh prophet, oh apostle, oh apostle. No. Oh Elijah, Elijah said, my father, my father. So you can't get a double portion by somebody praying for you. Nobody can pray a double portion on you. They say, I'm going to pray and God's going to give you a double portion. They fib to you. They didn't mean to. They were honest, but they can't do that. A double portion can only come by inheritance. You only get it by inheriting the greater portion of your father's goods. You get twice as much. That's why Elijah said to Elisha, are you with me right now? It worries me that Bible scholars can't follow. Can you follow me? Are you with me? Oh, you can. Okay. Okay. Elijah said, if you see me when I go away, the Hebrew says, if you see eye to eye with me when I leave you, you get what you have plus what I give you. That's the double portion. You get what you have plus what I give you. You get what you have plus what your father gave you. That's the generational blessing. That's why, look at me, look at me. That's why the generation now, we should have so much now that they didn't have then because the generations should have rolled up double, 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 double. until when we got to the end of the ages. We should be so powerful. And now I'm going to read you the, the verse that 
shakes me that shook the apostle Paul when he wrote to the New Testament church. Look at verse 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. Strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use, they have used it and used it. They've been through it and been through it. By reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know when it's God and you know when it's the devil. You don't have to guess. Should have been teachers. And we have a desperate need that somebody teach us. You know, one of the things that I struggle with, pastors, the other night when Bishop, we were talking, I, I saw this man of God, Bishop Jakes, almost wild. He was throwing napkins. He was rolling his eyes. We're sitting at a table beside himself. He said, I can't believe that we can get in congregations of people, pastors, ministers. And we start talking about the very basic things. And then you say, what did you get out of that? And somebody come back and says, God's going to bless me. There, there's a real tragedy happened to us. We have come into an anemia. We have children procreating children. We have babies having babies. And so rather than the generations in ministry getting stronger and more able and more comfortable and more understanding, it seems like there's a diluting of ministry. Almost anybody can stick their finger in a Bible. You can order your license out of the back of a ministry magazine. You don't have to do nothing or go off to Bible school somewhere so you can learn only one facet of somebody's doctrine rather than some wholeness in ministry. Come back after two or three years and you're ready to go and evangelize until you can find a church. And then we join an organization which is nothing more than an orphanage. For lost children who have no daddies. I have nothing against the organization. I think you ought to belong to anything you want to. I think it's tragic that that becomes your source of foundational direction and your source of impartation because most of those people are voted in and they don't give a flip about you. But they're worried to death they might get voted out. They'll tell you, just like an orphanage, when to go to bed, when to get up, what to wear, what not to wear, what you can eat, what you can't eat, what you can do. And, you, and, 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 that, and, that, and, and usually it's in a stream. You know, anytime you get together, how am I doing? Get together. What's the first thing you meet somebody and talking to another pastor you hadn't met him before? What's the first thing you say? Brother, how you doing? God bless you. Who are you with? Which slice of the pie do you belong to? Hey. Tell me what this is. Come on now, guy, use your imagination, because I'm not I'm not a very good artist. What is this? Jesus. Say it out loud. Jesus. Say it loud. Jesus. What is that? Jesus. That's Jesus? Jesus? Oh, pizza. Who said pizza? 
What is that? That's pizza. No, that's not pizza. That's a slice of pizza. This is pizza. But what we've done is we have denomed the nation. It was supposed to be a holy nation. A holy nation. A holy nation. But now we got to find out which stream you're in. Are you in the faith movement or are you in the word? Or are you in the worship and praise movement? Or are you in the spiritual warfare movement? And so we have Dinama divided and numbered the nation. Hence, we have all of our little Dinama nations. 